Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my pleasure to introduce this uh, session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And today we will discuss uh, financial infrastructure and especially in the context of China, the cross-border interbank payment system or SIPs. Uh, this is a very uh, nerdy theme today. Uh, it sounds arcane, but it's also very important, as we will discover, and raises a number of all uh, very uh, significant questions about the place of China in the global financial system and how it will transform the global system itself. Um, today, we have Felix Chang and uh, Emily Jin to discuss uh, SIPs. Felix uh, got his BA uh, on, in English language and literature at Yale University in 1999, and then uh, went into law, uh, got his JD degree at University of Michigan in 2006. Uh, Felix then worked in uh, Southeastern Europe, in Serbia and Montenegro in particular. He was affiliated with the Belgrade Center for Human Rights with research, uh, very interesting research on the Roma community and a number of uh, uh, related issues there. Uh, he then worked for law firms for Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati. And in 2011, he joined the University of Cincinnati College of Law, where he was the founding director of the Institute for the Global Practice of Law, an, organization, uh, an outfit that designs training programs for attorneys around the world. Uh, Felix has also been a visiting professor at the University of Graz in Austria, at the National Taiwan University last year, and now at the Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law, where he will stay, I think, for a year or two. And he teaches uh, antitrust law, business association, securities regulation, also wills and estates, which um, I want to know more about, uh, and, uh, and has a, a very um, recognized expertise on the topic we have today. Uh, Chinese financial infrastructure in general and SEPs in particular. Emily Jin uh, studied initially in Shanghai and at Georgetown University, where she got her BA in psychology uh, in 2016. Uh, she then uh, came here to Washington, D.C. at Size Johns Hopkins, where she got her MA, her master's degree in international economics and uh, China studies in 2020. Um, she interned during her studies at Size and uh, various uh, important places, including CIS next door, but also the US Department of Commerce and the US Export Import Bank. And in 2020, she joined CNS, CNAS, the Center for New American Security, where she works at the Energy Economics and Security Program. I should mention that uh, two months ago in, on, in September, Emily testified uh, on uh, the topic that occupies us today uh, in front of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development and Monetary Policy of the uh, Committee on Financial Services of the U.S. House of Representatives. So with that, uh, Felix, over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Nicholas, for having me to Peterson Institute for hosting and very much for the types of sanctions, dollar denominated sanctions that might flow if China invades Taiwan as well. Um, but these financial sanctions are going to be defanged if China can find a way to circumvent the dollar. So that's where SIPS ent enters into the conversation. But the thing is that SIPS is not the same as a payment messaging system like SWIFT. SIPS does have some messaging capabilities, but principally it's this type of financial market infrastructure that clears and settles transactions in renminbi. Now, as a law scholar, I'm primarily interested in using the lens of antitrust economics to examine SIPs and to try to determine what bearing SIPs might have on Beijing's project of renminbi internationalization. So let me begin with some basics. And I just have a few slides to share to provide some background. Um, first of all, some really basic definitions. Uh, by regulatory definition of currency, it's it's coin or paper money that is from any country that's designated as legal tender. It circulates um, and it's accepted as a medium of exchange in the country of issuance. Now, a currency internationaliz internationalizes when it circulates outside its issuing country. To fully understand that, we have to walk through the functionalities of currencies. So. A currency can serve as the medium of payment in a bilateral transaction between two counterparties. So the counterparties are from different countries. Um, a currency can serve a direct payment function. A currency can also constitute the vehicle for the pricing of goods traded across borders. That's the vehicle functionality. And then finally, 
when most people are thinking about currency internationalization, they're talking about the currency's revert reserve function. So that refers to the reserves of a currency that's stockpiled by foreign central banks. Now, for China in particular, its status is a trade and economic powerhouse really belies its shortcomings in the global use of the yuan of its currency. So Beijing's been keenly aware of its incongruence and it's really pushed for broader acceptance of the renminbi in cross-border transactions for over two decades now. It's reversed this long-standing policy of what's called, you know, what some would say is currency manipulation to depress the yuan's value to bolster its exports. And um, the way China went about internationalizing its currency, you oftentimes see Hong Kong used as a leverage um, where it can uh, use its status as a financial center to eventually expand the global acceptance of the renminbi. So with that backdrop, let's then go more specifically um, into, into SIPs. Now, um, SIPs is a currency clearinghouse. It clears and settles financial transactions. These clearinghouses you can think of as performing sort of a back office infrastructure function. So if in, in the more familiar markets to us, in the securities markets, if you've got a buyer and seller of stock, uh, you'll have a back office function uh, performed by securities clearinghouses. So one party um, will have to deliver the stock. The other party has to deliver the payment and the clearinghouse makes sure that the order is matched and that that trade is going to be cleared. Now, we know from clearing houses in other markets, like the securities and derivatives markets, that sometimes they can use to be uh, levers that suppress competition in these adjacent markets. So you have the clearing market, and then you have the trading office, uh, the trading market. Now here, I use this bottleneck graphic to depict a clearing house because it really functions as a sort of bottleneck through which all transactions must pass from the trading market into the clearing market. So. Um, the literature on clearinghouses tell us that they function best when they harness economies of scale with really different and diverse types of members. Um, more on that in a minute. We also know, again, that from securities and derivatives clearinghouses, that sometimes these entities can be used to suppress competition in the adjacent markets. Now, um, when it comes to SIPs, the central question, though, is whether the currency market is going to be different than these other markets that we see as more privately ordered. That is a couple of questions in here. Does the size of China's market mean that it's going to take a really different path to cornering that upstream trading market? Um, other questions are, does Beijing's use of the Belt and Road Initiative mean that it can open up greater markets for the acceptance of the renminbi? And then finally, unlike a lot of other markets that are privately traded where you have private players, here we're talking about sovereigns. Okay, so here is how SIPS works. Um, it's the central counterparty that clears and settles payment in renminbi from one party to another. And in this illustration, you might have, say, an overseas payor who might be another party trying to, uh, in another country, trying to pay an entity within China. Um, the payer and payee will have a correspondent banking relationship with a member of SIPS. Um, currently, there are 76 what's called direct members of SIPs. Um, these are mainly Chinese financial institutions and sometimes overseas offices of um, or overseas subsidiaries of a handful of um, either foreign banks or Chinese institutions. And there are about 1,300 indirect members. This is a model, incidentally, that replicates CHIPS. Um, CHIPS is in the US. It's the clearinghouse interbank payment system, and it clears transactions in US dollars. Now. In the past, um, prior to SIPs, the clearing of renminbi transactions had to go through this really complicated process of converting offshore renminbi to onshore renminbi through one of several clearing centers around the world. And these clearing centers were run by overseas offices of Chinese financial institutions. And once you had the clearing institution or the clearing network convert offshore and to onshore renminbi, then the renminbi could enter the domestic onshore renminbi clearing system called the China National Advanced Payment System, or sometimes you'll know it by its acronym of CNAPS. Um, the central question when it comes to SIPs is to what extent will it facilitate broader worldwide acceptance of the renminbi or renminbi internationalization? Even before the sanctions against Russia, SIPS was drawing attention because of its rapid growth. Here we see figures from the People's Bank of China, and that's the central regulator for SIPS. 
Um, we see that, uh, I'll translate, but in short, SIPS is clearing and selling about 12,000 average daily transactions worth a daily average of about 220 billion RMB or about 35 billion US dollars. By contrast, if you think about chips as a counterpoint, chips transmits and settles over 507,000 payment messages worth an aggregate of $1.78 trillion every day. So SIPS has nowhere near the scale or as I'll shortly discuss, uh, the membership diversity of CHIPS. Now, to answer the question about SIPS and RMB internationalization, I think it's important to bear in mind, again, the functions of currencies. Earlier, I talked about um, currencies performing this invoicing function. Currencies can be traded. They might have a vehicle function, and they may have a reserve function. Now, it's really important to keep in mind all these functionalities because uh, they're not all going to be settled and cleared. And so therefore, the degree to which SIPs might be used to leverage RMB's dominance into that adjacent trading market is going to be limited. Now, I'm just going to gloss through some of the points. I'll, I'll happily talk about them during Q&A, but um, here's where we go back to antitrust and economics. And I think that thinking through the meets and bounds of these different markets is going to be really useful to thinking about how SIPs can be leveraged because these functionalities are different and these markets, the currencies aren't all going to be interchangeable. Okay, um, so I think I just have a few more minutes. So let me just breeze through my slides. Um, these, by the way, are um, these are going to be statistics from SWIFT. SWIFT has this monthly RMB tracker, which shows the degree to which the RMB has internationalized. These figures, by the way, are, are pretty steady. So the yuan has not really broken the fifth position in the many different functionalities, whether it's direct payment or invoicing or the use of RMB in financing. It's really held steady at number five. Uh, for about a year, maybe a few years ago, it had broken into the fourth position, but it, it, it's held pretty steady. Now, maybe a couple of the final things that I'll talk about are economies of scale and scope. So um, I think of SIPs in the analog of, if we look to some financial reforms that had happened about a decade ago in the derivatives market, they're really structurally similar. So Prior to the financial crisis, derivatives transactions were cleared on a bilateral basis. So this is a really well-known graphic that depicts centralized clearing reforms in the derivatives markets before and after um, these reforms in the U.S. through Dodd-Frank and um, in the European Union. Now, before the reforms, there was bilateral clearing. So it's really similar to what we had in the offshore onshore RMB clearing system. Afterwards, there was this mandate of centralized clearing where you have a CCP is probably going to be familiar to this audience, but CCP here means central counterparty, not the Chinese Communist Party. But the CCP, you've got the central infrastructure, which now clears and settles all trades. So now you've concentrated financial counterparty and systemic risk in this large node of the CCP. Now, this is important because the way CCPs function best is if they have really large and diverse memberships. And for right now, SIPs really doesn't. You know, most of its direct members are going to be Chinese financial institutions. They're dominated by Chinese financial institutions, which means that it doesn't have nearly the economies of scale and scope, one, to diffuse systemic risk, and two, to really benefit from economies of scale and scope. In other infrastructures, if we think about other types of utilities, um, even Facebook or digital platforms, they're really able to harness diverse membership sets to get you greater economies of scale. Uh, I think maybe the last thing that I'll talk about is perhaps um, maybe just, just to wrap up a couple of final points. Right now, I don't see SIPs as being a real difference maker in getting the renminbi to corner a greater share of the international currencies market. It might help transactions in yuan become more efficient, but at most, it performs this back office functionality that might make the currency more attractive. But just in a global market where several major currencies are competing. Um, the final dimensions of my project I'm happy to explore in Q&A. They're much more legal. They include the role that law and policy should play in setting standards of governance, and also in thinking through what's been longstanding, this doctrine in antitrust where you can't really sue um, sovereigns. It's called the act of state doctrine. But I think that is more private actors are performing these public financial functions and maybe we should kind of rethink that doctrine but here i'm going to stop sharing and cede 
uh, the floor to Emily. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you Go off. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much, Felix, for your thoroughly researched insights. And to kick off my remarks, I just wanted to preface it by saying it is an honor to share the panel today with you both. I'll just follow really quickly with a couple of minutes on the national security implications of China SIPs. So I study China's alternative payment systems and rails in the context of great power competition between the United States and China. This morning, I'll specifically discuss the one key takeaway people should have about why SIPs could be a national security threat to the United States. Then I'll talk about two kinds of future scenarios the U.S. and the rest of the world may find themselves in with regards to SIPs. And finally, I'll discuss three policy recommendations for the U.S. government, which will make up a policy posture to prepare America for a future where alternative payment systems might be more prominent than they are today. Um, first, on the one key national security threat of China's SIPs, the concern with China's SIPs is not that SIPs would help the RMB internationalize. So Felix also had alluded to this in his presentation. In fact, RMB internationalization requires uh, the kind of political and economic changes inside of China that are just not going to happen for a very long time, uh, i.e. liberalization of the capital account and letting the exchange rate flow freely. So the concern isn't about China's currency that would flow through the pipes of international finance. The concern rather is on the alternative pipes themselves that China is currently building. And if this RMB clearinghouse gets more internationally facing by expanding its networking capability and takes on increasingly a little bit more SWIFT-like features over time, it could just become a more reliable pipeline. And sanctioned entities may just take advantage of China's alternative offering of financial plumbing. And that could erode the power of sanctions. Um, second, I'll just project two kinds of scenarios for the future of the global financial order. Uh, the base case will be the status quo. This will be a continuation of the U.S. dollar serving as the world's reserve currency and the associated financial infrastructure, maintaining the USD's penetration and influence. As long as the U.S. dollar is the preeminent currency, alternative payment systems like SIPs and some others like Russia's SPFS would not really be able to mount meaningful challenges. And sanctioned states and entities uh, might just form coalitions to use alternative payment systems more. Yes, that's possible. Assuming that alternative payment systems have meaningful collaboration and become highly interoperable, these are two big ifs. Um, sanctioned entities may be able to trade on alternative payment systems, even though they may be penalized by G7 economies. So, and the level of these transactions might not meaningfully evade the power of U.S. economic and financial san sanctions. So this is the base case. It still requires attention. But policy considerations should not really stop at the base case. If the Chinese leadership makes the painful political and economic reforms down the line, the Chinese political economic model could become more attractive and the RMB might just be a more appealing store of value. In this alternative case, this could mean Chinese and other alternative payment systems and financial rails uh, could over time garner critical mass in adoption. And in that event or scenario, China would have had years to fine tune and perfect its payment systems and financial rails. So foreign financial institutions and firm uh, firms, they may be compelled to adopt SIPs clearing and settlement as they likely would not want to miss out on participating in China's alternative systems. And in that case, maybe uh, China and other countries could get to a position of strength to challenge the United States in the global financial order. So in, in the base case or the alternative case for future global financial order, there are immediate actions that the United States should consider taking. I have three recommendations. The first is analytic. So I recommend the United States government in supporting institutions that conduct research on America and China's financial statecraft, but especially in monitoring the use, growth, and the connectivity of all alternative payment rails outside of the United States. And the uh, second recommendation is defensive. Um, specifically, the government should consider uh, measures that could restrict the advancement of alternative payment rails and prevent sanctioned entities from taking advantage of these payment systems. Uh, so, for example, if certain actors are trying to evade sanctions by specifically facilitating transactions through SIPs, 
the Treasury Department should consider levying secondary sanctions on entities that help with the transactions. But of course, uh, the Treasury Department needs to conduct uh, analysis prior to uh, just to forestall or prevent the unintended consequences that might come down the line in that course of action. The third recommendation is uh, proactive. And, and with that, I recommend concerted efforts from both the public and private sector uh, actors in improving U.S. cross-border payment pipelines to make dollar transactions even more efficient. Uh, to wrap up, I recommend a policy posture that is informed, anticipatory, but not overly alarmist. After asking the question on how alternative payment systems, one of the most mature ones of which is China SIPs, are developing, the United States should focus on how it can maintain leadership in international finance and continue to exert influence in the global financial ecosystem. Uh, I think I yield the stage back to Nicholas. Thank you. That's great. Um, Felix, um, Emily presented SIPS as an alternative payment system. Um, is uh, Do you agree with that characterization? Or because uh, uh, on the face of it, SIPS is a reasonable thing for China to have, right? So, so yeah. in which... In which sense uh, is is it a uh, um, alternative as opposed to, I guess, uh, mainstream? Um, well, I, I think one way of thinking through is it alternative is is it kind of an antagonistic system? And um, I'll, I'll begin with the premise that it it is an alternative, and I accept also that it is necessary because if you have a really fragmented clearing system, you get not only inefficiencies but arguably you might heighten systemic risk. Um, what happens in that alternative system is when you had the onshore offshore clearing centers, you had these pools of liquidity that were, you know, spread around the world, and it's sometimes thought that they might enhance systemic risk. So, uh, I think this is this is inevitable if China is going to have a more streamlined and efficient system of clearing of renminbi payments that you're, you're inevitably going to head there. Now, from the policy standpoint, the question is whether that alternative is necessarily antagonistic, and if SIPS is utilized to evade sanctions, of course it is. I'm not sure that it's necessarily intended to utilize ways of trying to get around uh, U.S. dollar-denominated sanctions, though. So in that respect, I think that it might be really complementary. Um, a lot of commentators are thinking that we might be heading, to, heading toward this more multipolar world where you've got currencies playing more importance regionally. And we might imagine the renminbi becoming more important within, say, Southeast Asia. If that's the case, then, you know, the renminbi internationalization and SIPs might serve as some sort of a backstop in the event that you have a liquidity crisis that's located within Southeast Asia. And so in that respect, it's not altogether antagonistic. It doesn't necessarily have to be. And just, um, uh, I, oh, I wanted to add on quickly to Felix's uh, point, if that's yeah. okay. Uh, just in terms of timeline, uh, the uh, PBOC has been talking about, like, came up with the idea of SIPs actually in about, I, I believe, 2012. So if you think about the timeline, it's like that's kind of the domestic necessity of wanting more efficiency in its payment system uh, because the Ru Russian encroachment of uh, Crimea, this was like 2014. So it's not like a after 2014 that's decided we need to have an alternative payment system. So completely agree with Felix's point that like this is a domestic necessity, uh, but it could also potentially be viewed in an antagonistic way, although it doesn't have to be viewed in that way. Basically, it can be viewed as antagonistic as any Chinese infrastructure buildup can be viewed as antagonistic, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And um, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I have a, f a couple of questions which are mainly technical. Um, Emily, you mentioned financial rails, and this is common parlance uh, for people who care about payments, but can you just quickly, very quickly, explain to us what that means? Uh, the way I define it is essentially how currencies or transactions or payments, rather, flow through the financial system. So uh, feel free to contradict me if you think this is wrong, though, but I think of financial rails as SIPs is one of them, but it's more domestically focused within the Chinese system, or it's uh, what Felix has described, a bottleneck of clearing and settling RMB. But you can also think about, I personally think of uh, the, uh, I think I saw a question actually in the Q&A, the ECNY, China's digital yuan or electronic yuan, as another financial rail, or rather a node or a, a type of right. currency or asset flowing through the rail. So anything that helps facilitate movement of value. Um, let's go back to this issue of SIPs and SWIFT. Um, 
So you made it clear that they're different animals, right? Because uh, SIPS is a clearinghouse, Swift is not. Uh, SIPS uses, uh, in, in includes a messaging system, but it can also um, use messages that go through the Swift infrastructure. So Felix, can you uh, give us a little bit more detail on the competition, complementarity, uh, interplay between SIPS and Swift? Because that's a big part of what people talk about when they talk about SIPS. Yeah, happy to. And I've heard Emily's testimony on this subject as well. Um, uh, as we both point out, they're not the same thing. So Swift is, you can think of it as transmitting payment messaging codes. So in interbank transactions, um, they'll communicate with one another and the way they communicate might be through Swift codes. Now, what SIPS does is actually clears and settles transactions. So it's much more like back office infrastructures and say when you are trading the securities or some sort of other financial product, again, it matches buy and sell orders, ensures delivery of payment by the seller and delivery of the instrument by, sorry, delivery of payment by the buyer and delivery of the instrument by the seller. So it, it, it's different. SIPS does use, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nicholas. No, go ahead. Um, SIPS does use, SIPS still needs payment messaging systems. And, and right now it's using Swift. Um, it is developing its own payment messaging system, I think based on Chinese characters rather than the Latin alphabet. Uh, so right now they're, they're complementary, and it's thought that SIPS cut eventually, once it goes fully fledged and has developed it in, and that you have more, more, more buyers of the SIPS payment messaging system at perhaps at some point it might displace Swift. I think that it's still hard to because in the market that really matters, which is the market that's not the clearing and settlement or the payment messaging market, if it's all still dollar denominated transactions at the international level, um, SIPS can't leverage its way into displacing the dollar and therefore I don't think it can displace SWIFT. The one really interesting part of that complementarity though is that, you know, later I was, earlier I was sharing statistics from Swiss Renminbi tracker. Now, if you go to statistics from the People's Bank of China about the degree of internationalization and the utilization of SIPs, it's going to be different. I think that you get a, a, a broader array or, or broader universe, a broader snapshot when you look at the PBOC, because SWIFT only captures things that go through SWIFT. So the interesting thing about that complementarity is going through PBOC statistics, you see a fuller version of the utilization of the RIMB. I, I hope that helps, but I think they're complementary, not necessarily um, identical or antagonistic. So just, to, just to clarify, um, is it the case that all transactions that are cleared by chips, international transactions, sorry, yeah. that are cleared by, by chips, are they all um, uh, messaged through the SWIFT infrastructure or do some of them escape the yeah. SWIFT messaging? That, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I okay. think they go through SWIFT, but I, I'm not sure. I, and I uh, conversely, con conversely what you imply is that uh, if uh, if at some point uh, SIPS is used by more international players with more international members, for example, Russian, uh, those Russian members will have to learn Chinese, right? Yeah, although I, it might just be the payment messaging function that's delivered through Chinese characters. You may still be able to, on your end, I'm, I'm guessing coded in Latin, Cyrillic alphabet, I, I'm not sure. Fascinating. Uh, Emily? Uh, I guess I just wanted to respond to the point about whether SIPS has intention, perhaps, down the line to circumvent SWIFT. Uh, so I, I actually, f I, I found a PBOC, People's Bank China presentation, presentation deck from 2018 from their payments department. Um, there, there's a very uh, interesting graphic. The graphic has no legend, so there's not a lot of explanation. But the, the way it, it's it's a world map essentially. I'm just gonna try to describe it visually so the audience can uh, visualize with me. It's a world map where uh, from China there are these uh, uh, lines that essentially go to other countries, and that's indicating essentially uh, whether they're using Swift or not using Swift. Uh, but basically, in the map, you can see that uh, to North America, South America, and some other uh, jurisdictions, you can see there's a uh, usage of SWIFT. But to some other regions, you can see that there's uh, uh, another indication, another kind of visual basically indicating what I assume is not using SWIFT down the line. So that visual is very confusing just because it doesn't have any explanation. It has no timeline. But 
if we want to take that visual and interpret it, it's, it's possible that uh, the strategists or the people behind SIFs are potentially considering a future. But uh, to Felix's point earlier, though, it's uh, this kind of code, right? Like SWIFT messaging is just so broadly used to get like global financial institutions on board with SIFs um, that that might be a little bit of a difficult sale, just even from the functional Sorry, part, is there not a to mention the geopolitical. Between- Sorry, is there a distinction between the standards of messaging and the infrastructure of messaging? So is it plausible that SIPS uh, would uh, use the SWIFT standards for uh, the format of its messages, but without uh, channeling those messages through the SWIFT messaging infrastructure? Does that question make sense, Felix? Oh, I don't have a um, quick answer, so I'm looking at Felix. <laughs> oh, so, sorry, I was trying to mute yourself. I, myself, I was going to defer to you, Emily, but it, it does. It, it does. There is a difference. I think the standard, it's called the IOS. There's some sort of, um, there's an acronym for the standard for yeah, which cool. SIPS is, a, yeah, th- that's what it is. So for which SIPS is going to abide by. So I think that the standard is different than the messaging infrastructure. And so SWIFT both has the messaging infrastructure and also the code. But yes, I, there is a difference. So we have an easy, a question from uh, Gerhard uh, Alter Herberg, uh, who is asking about the, um, uh, the possibilities that SIPs can intermediate uh, or uh, clear transactions uh, in other currencies on an offshore basis. So, for example, let's assume that uh, you know India uh, counterparties in uh, India and Japan respectively want to transact in US dollar. Uh, can they use SIPs or is SIPs a, a uniquely renminbi infrastructure where no other c- currencies can be uh, transacted? It's just renminbi. And if in renminbi, can they be used, uh, that's also a question from Gerha, in terms of, uh, well, clearly they can be used in terms of onshore versus onshore, so inside China, offshore versus onshore, I guess, in all situations, if there are uh, the corresponding uh, clearing members, uh, but can can it be used offshore versus offshore? So can uh, can counterparts in uh, respectively India and Japan transact in renminbi uh, by using SIPs? Yeah, they they should be able to, and I think that that's ultimately the ambition. If you have a currency serving as a vehicle currency, um, the counterparties are not necessarily going to be from China. Emily, I, I'll I'll defer to you as well to see if you want to chime in. But yes, that that should be in theory where it's headed. I think in theory that that's right, um, but according to the 2018 uh, PBOC presentation, which I know it could be outdated, it's possible that they've updated since then. Um, it seems like, uh, like Felix, you mentioned in a presentation, indirect uh, participants yes. and direct participants. So the participants are, are Chinese institutions, financial institutions. So my understanding from the visuals in, in the PBOC deck is uh, all financial institutions have to go through Chinese financial institutions, clear to RMB. So I'm thinking, assuming what the 2018 presentation uh, present, like it holds true to this day, I'm assuming it's still going to have to go through Chinese financial institutions uh, if it's a foreign bank. So is it only Chinese financial institutions? Um, why aren't uh, non-Chinese banks direct clearing members? Is that because SIPS doesn't want them to be and China doesn't want them to be? Or is it because... Uh, the requirements to become a SIPS direct uh, clearing member are so onerous that basically no foreign institution in their right mind would want to be one. Uh, is it a, a demand or supply uh, factor in a way, uh, Felix? My, my sense of why there aren't more non-Chinese direct participants is that that's kind of still part and parcel of China's real reluctance to really open up its market um, it's kind of unfamiliarity with other um, with with entities from other jurisdictions. The requirements aren't onerous, um, at least from from the the membership application that's posted on SIPS. And this is one of the problems with SIPS, where it's still not entirely transparent. You know, it's it's really a, a financial market utility. They're supposed to abide by international standards of transparency, but some of these things are really hard to figure out. But you can find applications for direct and indirect membership, and they don't appear to be very onerous at all. Um, But my sense of why it hasn't really been broadly opened up to financial institutions from other jurisdictions is just, again, the reluctance to, maybe the reluctance to 
out of a sense that you're truly then opening up the Chinese market to foreign investors. Um, that that that's my sense. Uh, you're certainly right when you contrast it to say chips or clearinghouse membership of any other market. It's much broader and much more diverse. With uh, a remark from Jing Yang, uh, who says uh, that uh, probably stand, uh, Standard Chartered and a couple of other yeah, Western banks that's right. are direct participants in SIPs, right. I guess HSBC would probably be in the same category. Uh, how significant are they? Is there any way of knowing uh, whether that's a side show or whether they're actually an important channel? No, it, it's really hard to figure out. Um, in the statistics you you normally get, you get aggregated statistics of daily and you know monthly or annual clearing volume. You don't get it broken down by banks, and 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 that you probably can't necessarily expect to find out. Um, even in the U.S., if you look at different clearinghouses, you won't have that type of breakdown. But you might see it not through the clearinghouse, but you might see it through. Um, you know, through the financial regulator. So for instance, if you want to get disaggregated statistics for say derivatives trading, you can go to the OCC, um, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which does break down trading by banks and bank holding companies. But um, these statistics, this breakdown is going to be difficult to be had. So I want to zoom out a little bit. And um, obviously there are a number of geopolitical ramifications. So first, Kind of obvious question. Uh, Russia uh, has been hit by sanctions, uh, isolated from the global financial system uh, to a large extent since fe late February. Uh, maybe starting with you, Emily, uh, has SIPS helped Russia in any way so far? Uh, my understanding is, again, it's like pretty opaque, uh, just echoing what Felix has said earlier. Uh, I, I understand, I don't see any smoking gun evidence as as of like institutions or sanctioned entities specifically using um, SIPs to transact and meaningfully evade U.S. sanctions. But that, that's the fear right down the line is uh, for entities to be able to practice that. Uh, but of course, uh, then you open that can of worms of is RMB uh, an attractive currency for, for like Russian entities to hold right now? Um, that's a bigger question that I won't go into. But I'm understanding right now, my understanding is there is a smoking gun evidence of like many Russian entities using SIPs to return that. So, so that's a question from Akib Niaz. Uh, where do we see, um, so Russians past and present efforts toward uh, de-dollarization, do we see them connected to SIPs in any way? Or at this point, these are completely separate worlds from the available public information, as you said rightly, Emily. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say they're connected in a sense that de-dollarization uh, has been happening like separately inside of China, but separately inside of Russia. But also there's uh, some viral currency swaps that they use to settle their trade and that, that gets renewed every three years. So it's happening on the margins, uh, if you will, but uh, it's not happening in a meaningful way that's going to truly relieve um, the sanctioned Russian economy. But, but it's happening, but I wouldn't call it, like I wouldn't draw a straight line between, but I think it's in the same universe of some partial on the peripheral uh, de-dollarization that's happening in both countries, but also some joint efforts. Felix on Russia? Yes. Yeah. So I, 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 I agree with Emily. I think there is some, uh, there's been Chinese news sources that have said that the Chinese purchasing oil from Russia, that some of those payments are now are made in B. I'm just not sure if they could go through SIPs. So there is no direct line necessarily from SIPs currently to sanctions evasion. Um, in terms of de-dollarization, Perhaps on the margins, there is some more de-dollarization that's happening as a result of, you know, this liberal use of dollar denominated sanctions. But, um, you know, that that you think about the types of um, states that 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 might ward off the dollar and they're, you're probably talking about some autocracies. But I think the U.S. itself is precipitating de-dollarization more in how the Federal Reserve is handling interest rates. So there's a lot that we're doing to prompt de-dollarization, you know, raising interest rates with abandon without regard to what effect it has um, on the purchase power of, of a lot of emerging economies. So, um, well, yeah, um, so, that, so le le that leads us to a different debate. Uh, I'd like to go back to the technicalities for a second because we have a question by Jacqueline Kremos. Uh, and uh, I guess that one is for you, Felix. Um, if I, I read the question, um, uh, if SIPS is a real-time growth settlement system, what is involved in the clearing portion of the transaction? 
uh, are transactions still netted? And how does SIBS guarantee the transaction? Uh, uh, namely, does it still complete payment uh, even if one counterparty defaults, Felix? Yeah, it, it before it was a gross settlement. And now there were two phases. And I think in the last phase, it is now net settlement. So then there is going to be more of a function that SIPs can perform, which is to, to net or to offset payment. And just by, by way of background for others who are unfamiliar, one of the real values with clearinghouses is they have this bird's eye view over all the transactions. And then they can really enhance trading efficiency because they can say, okay, this party owes this much to this other party, but this party owes this much to a third party. And the clearinghouse with the bird's eye view can net the transactions and offset them against one another. So um, this is where some of that opacity comes in yet again. Um, SIPS was was very proud of the fact that it, it when it rolled out phase two, it moved from gross settlement to net to net settlement. And in theory, it's supposed to be able to perform that functionality. Um, but beyond that, I can't see much more than otherwise it was rolled out in, in phase two. So when you say it's not transparent, let me be clear. This is not just about language because you are fluent in Chinese, no. right? So, no. so, uh, so, so it's, it, it really is uh, in Chinese as in English, uh, very little information uh, yeah. provided by the website compared to peers. Yes, yes. So and my Chinese is okay. So because I grew up here, I, I can, I could, you know, my reading ability is okay. It's a little bit limited. It's a little bit slow. But what's interesting about SIPs is that it's a website where the Chinese and English translations are virtually identical. In a lot of Chinese entities, the, the Chinese version and the English version is really, really different, where the Chinese version is much more robust. But for SIPs, it's, it's virtually identical. And I've combed through most of the pages and been really surprised at how similar it is, which perhaps means that it's making a play, I don't know, for broader internationalization. So, so in that respect, you don't see the disparity between English and Chinese versions. It, it's simply where I talk about, and Emily talks about the intransparency, it's simply that there's not that much information. Um, sometimes you have to come through reports from the People's Bank of China. Um, there's another, there, there's these annual renminbi internationalization reports that's published, I think, from PBOC, and I think maybe from Renmin University. Um, if you really want to get statistics, you have to come through those. But from SIPs, it's hard to garner as much information as you could from other clearinghouses and other jurisdictions. So we've compared SIPs with uh, SWIFT. Let me move on uh, again with a question from uh, Gerhard Kalter Herberg on uh, SIPs and CLS. Uh, we had a session in this series about CLS Bank and the CLS Group a couple of months ago uh, with the CEO of CLS. Um, and CLS is really about um, uh, settling uh, intercurrency transactions, right? So foreign exchange transactions. Uh, is there any chance that SIPs could go into CLS territory in the future, or is it just a question of whether CLS as a global utility uh, will one day uh, include uh, the renminbi? Is that something that either of you has uh, looked at? I'm not familiar with CLS. My apologies. I Am, am I reading of uh, PBOC documents? I haven't seen any indication in that direction in terms of SIPs taking on some CLS-like quality, if you will, or any kind of move in that direction. But that would be an interesting direction to watch out for, for sure. So sorry if I couldn't offer any more no, to me, uh, insights. To me, the, to, to me, the question is intriguing because CNS is really not a national infrastructure, whereas, whereas SIPS is a national infrastructure. Right. I mean, as there is a special role of the Fed in the uh, oversight of CLS, but that's as far as it gets. It, uh, but so... Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, a matter for follow-up discussion. But, but, but let's focus a bit more on this issue of SIPs as a as an infrastructure in an international environment, right? You you mentioned the ISO whatever numbers uh, yeah. standard. Uh, there is also all the overlay of uh, standards and uh, and governance through the international bodies like the CPMI, the Committee on Payment and Market Infrastructures, and IOSCO, the International Organization of Securities Commission. So CPMI and IOSCO issue common standards on global financial infrastructure. So maybe your first question is, is SIPs compliant with CPMI IOSCO? Is there any uh, international review of that? And also, can you give us a sense if you have any, um, if you have looked at that, 
in how China, not just SIPS, but the Chinese authorities, the PBOC, are participating in these global committees in CPMI, in IOSCO, uh, in the Financial Stability Board, in other uh, such uh, uh, bodies, in a way that would, uh, you know, make SIPS more part of, um, you know, a web of global linkages. Yeah, so, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Emily. Oh, uh, I, I don't have a long answer. Besides, I actually haven't looked into how SIPS is compliant with CPMI. Uh, I understand it is compliant with ISO, though, um, but that's Chinese reporting, so take it with a huge grain of salt. Um, the interesting thing about in terms of analogs of how the uh, China participates in international organizations, I think uh, in terms of how China pushes standards around the, its digital currency, actually, you see quite a lot of participation, right. active spearheading uh, of Chinese, well, PBOC actually recently, actually not recently, a couple months ago, it submitted a proposal, for example, for third party payments, right? Uh, and I believe PBOC is, is a bank that actually drafted and spearheaded the whole proposal. Right. So I haven't seen the language on the proposal, but I think the fact that it's it's quite active in any standard setting bodies, but also forums of uh, like, for example, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, Settlements, the PBO is extremely active in that in terms of shaping the conversations. So I think- In what, in uh, what, uh, in what the, way? Uh, this is actually, this is in one of the questions that someone asked. Uh, the PBOC is pushing for what they call an M-Bridge project, which is essentially a CBDC to CBDC interoperable platform. And of course, the PBOC is working with the Bank for International Settlements, but it's also working with central banks from Thailand, central banks uh, from the UAE on setting essentially or testing rather a CC to CBDC platform and functionality. And in fact, they actually just wrapped um, their testing uh, uh I think a six weeks test on on the oh, area. Just, uh, just for us to understand, is is Embridge a BIS project or is it a PBOC project? So it is a BIS uh, project, but the way it's okay. framed from press releases, it seems that there's heavy collaboration between PBOC, BIS, uh, central banks from Thailand, UAE, and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. So that's quite interesting. Um, and that's and, presumably and function, from uh, that's presumably through the BIS uh, Innovation Hub, right? Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but that, that, that's kind of that's a great case study for how China, uh, the Chinese central bank is extremely active in standard setting. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out more uh, in terms of shaping standards uh, around SIFs. But that's absolutely a fascinating area for me to dive into. Uh, future research. And that's a question from uh, from Karim Ferhat. Just, uh, ju just on this, um, is Embridge a standard setting project or is that a, 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 a pilot project? Uh, in terms of the BIS Innovation Hub, because as far as I understand, the Innovation Hub within the BIS is not really part of the BIS standard setting infrastructure. So can you clarify that? Yeah, so I, absolutely, I'll clarify. Uh, this is going to be a, sound like a call out answer. It's a pilot that's going to have standard implications, potentially, right. just because it's like the first of its kind. Right. Phoenix. Um, so the only thing that I wanted to add with respect to your question of how uh, of SIPs and compliance with international standards. Um, the other dimension that I've looked closely at is BIS has a standard on international payment systems and financial market utilities. And they, a lot of those standards revolve around transparency. A lot of those standards have been, been embedded in regulation in the US and the EU. I just don't see, at least from what I can see, I, I'm not sure that they've been adopted. Certainly again, SIPs, it, it's certainly not as transparent. Um, is others of these financial market infrastructures. And I think the reason why it matters is that a lot of these standards on FMUs are going to be adopted by national governments that I can expect that at some point, if there's a risk that these utilities might go down, uh, the the sovereign is going to come in as a backstop and provide you know liquidity. It'll be the liquidity provider of last resort. It might guarantee um, these financial market utilities. And in exchange, it's going to want a lot more disclosures, transparency, and that's kind of the exchange that you have between the FMU and the state or the regulator. I'm just not sure we have a sense of what that looks like in China and in SIPs. Uh, you mentioned the, the backstopping role of the state. Uh, I guess SIPs is fully state-owned. Can you tell us no, about it, its, its No, it's independent. So it's independent. It, it's, a, it's a company that's, that's in Shanghai and it's, it's independent. It's fully independent. 
but in, it, it has shareholders and shareholders presumably also big banks which are themselves state owned correct yeah our, our, arguably i mean yeah so so that's perhaps where that nexus might come in um the other nexus is of course you've got a state regulator in the pboc but that's not that's not different than in any, any other jurisdiction it's ostensibly supposed to be private and i think that that's that's by design um, I think that association that's clo too close with the Chinese state, it, it just doesn't, um, it, it's a, I, I don't think it would give a lot of the direct members that much comfort, but it's supposed to be independent. Emily, have you looked more into the ownership of SIPs? Uh, I would just be co-signing what Felix is saying, uh, how, like, I don't think the separation, the, the ostensible separation between the state and the private is that convincing in this case. Uh, but that was absolutely intentional in the way they designed it. Who owns it? Uh, so it's its own company. Um, it's the, I think it's the, it's it's called the, the it's, it's this long name, the Ch SIPS Limited. Uh, it's supposed to be independently owned. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I'm not too sure. Okay, um, not sure they have disclosed it, so we'll double check. Uh, let's uh, let's again zoom out to the um, again geopolitics of this. Uh, we have a question from uh, Randy Henning on uh, SIPs and the Belt and Road, and uh, I think you alluded to that, Felix. But can you expand a little bit? So, so what is is there any connection between SIPs and the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, and uh, Randy mentions that uh, BRI, Belt and Road transactions yeah. have remained in US dollars so far, but we had brought Parks in this series uh, a couple of episodes ago saying that more and more we had macro assistance by the PBOC yeah. in the context of Belt and Road that right. was uh, provided in Renminbi. So, so right. does SIP play a role in all that saga or is that a completely separate space? Yeah, so I, I think it's going to be tangentially related. The precursor to SIPs was um, you had these bilateral swap lines between the PBOC and central banks of other jurisdictions. Now, um, financial economists who've done the research have proven that as Belt and Road initiatives have come into a country, it enhances bilateral swap agreements between the PBOC and that country. So SIPs is built on the foundation that was laid by this network of bilateral swaps agreements among central banks. Um, so in that respect, it's tangentially related. I think where it's really related is that I, I mentioned that it's helpful to think of this market as two markets that come together. One is the clearing market, and then you have this adjacent trading market. So where the Belt and Road Initiative really helps is it helps in that trading market. You can think of the Belt and Road Initiative as almost opening up markets as serving as what, you know, almost like a market maker of expanding demand and expanding a market for um, the rimming B. And in that respect, it's going to create greater demand and then funnel more transactions through SIP. So that linkage isn't direct from what I can tell, but the linkage is there from the precursor of SIPs through these bilateral swap agreements. Uh, Jing Yang is uh, commenting on this, saying, uh, well, asking whether there's still, whether China is still serious about internationalizing the renminbi, adding, uh, it seems like we haven't seen any real capital account liberalization since 2016. Do you agree or do you think that this project is still alive and kicking? That's, that, that's the conundrum. So which is, is, is China sui generis? Is it going to be different at all from the other modes that we've seen. And we've seen in other areas of say legal development where by virtue of the size of its market, it's managed to get around the ordinary pathways, let's say economic liberalization without property rights. So the question is, is the mold of SIPs different at all? So, um, you know, the literature is split on this. I think most Western commentators are firmly in the camp that you can't have renminbi internationalization. You can't have renminbi internationalization without fully opening up the Chinese market without equalizing or without destroying this, you know, artificial separation between onshore and offshore renminbi. But at the same time, it does seem to be, that is renminbi internationalization does seem to be a prestige project that Beijing is firmly committed to. So, um, you know, it's a little bit a, of that's a That's rhetorical more than, uh, act, uh, than actual, right? 
asked. If, if, no, if it's just a prestige project, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it is not necessarily followed by a lot of action or, or have we seen that recently? Well, I think arguably you could use, you could take BRI as, 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 as a demonstration you know, as evincing its real interest in opening up the rimming B. BRI not only has these bilateral swap lines, but there's more and more, you know, there's direct payment. Um, there's perhaps facilitation of investment that's denominated in rimming B. So I think it's all going to come to a head, the degree to which China is going to open up its financial system. I mean, some would say that letting Evergrande default and letting the real estate market self-correct, it shows some real intention on the part of the Chinese government of, you know, letting market forces liberalize, but it's really hard to say from my perspective, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I think that, I think Beijing is serious about renminbi internationalization though. Emily? Uh, I have to take the opposite point of view, which is, uh, I think of it as more the prestige project that you mentioned, but mostly in uh, rhetorics. Um, I, I think if there's any kind of capital account or capital, uh, like liberalization, you would see a bank run on the entire Chinese e political economic system, which is what the Chinese leaders, they don't want that necessarily. Um, but I do okay. like just suppose like down the line, though, like if the RMB, the currency itself becomes attractive, then it, uh, I think I made that point earlier in the presentation. Uh, Beijing will have had many, many years to build uh, the financial pipes or perfect the financial pipes in, that could facilitate RMB flow. So in that case, uh, that could be a sobering future, but that's not the kind of future scenario that I, I uh, foresee. Uh, a technical question asked by uh, Ceci Papa Giannidou, um, that's for the nerd. Is there settlement finality on SIPs, um, uh, Felix? Is there settlement? Settlement finality? Settlement finality. Yeah, there, there, there should be. You mean just basically where, basically where SIPS comes in and then settles the transactions that are supposed to be, yes. Okay, uh, that's what I suspected. Uh, we also have a precision from Jingyang on uh, SIPS shareholding because we discussed that as a largest shareholder is a PBOC with 16%. Uh, other includes state-owned entity like NAFMI. I don't yeah. remember what that is. Union Pay, which is the equivalent of... Uh, card companies, the biggest Chinese banks, et cetera, but also some non-mainland Chinese banks like HSBC, Standard Charter, DBS of Singapore, Hang Seng Bank of Hong Kong, uh, et cetera. So uh, presumably it's mostly uh, owned by Chinese state-owned entities, but uh, with a diverse uh, shareholder base and, um, and including some non-CCP uh, non governed with the CCP meaning China Communist Party in that case. Um, let me finish with a, a brief question about uh, Swift. We have that question from Patrick Swift, uh, Flynn, um, not Swift. Um, uh, is, uh, I mean, in a way, Emily, you, you answered this uh, already, but, uh, but, but uh, how, how is Swift, Patrick mentioned Swift sanctioning that could be made redundant by uh, SIPs. Actually, the question I, <laughs> I want to ask is, uh, what do you think of the de-swifting of Russian banks and the, and the effects of that? So maybe maybe we don't have enough time to address this question comprehensively, but you know the EU removed a bunch of Russian banks from SWIFT that has global extraterritorial effects, of course, because SWIFT is global. Um, do you think that was wise? How do you look at that uh, at, at that uh, action? It's not really about SIPs, but it's about the broader environment. Maybe uh, Emily first, Felix uh, then, and we'll conclude on that. Uh, the only point I'll say is the uh, U.S. financial leverage or U.S. financial power or uh, G7 economies rather um, are so powerful. Um, it can be used as a very blunt tool. Um, that's all I can comment on that just because okay. I, I don't have an all-seeing eye <laughs> into the okay, future. Thanks. Uh, Felix? Yeah, so on the question of de-swifting of the Russian banks. I mean, it's one of the tools in the toolkit that you have. And so, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it was deployed. I think it was probably rightfully deployed. It, it's, you know, for financial institutions, it's, it's thought of as like really extreme. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think, I think it was a tool that was deployed probably rightfully so. And some of the effects perhaps are that you might encourage a lot of other states to really think about alternative financial systems. 
On that note, thanks very much to Felix Chang and Emily Jin uh, for this fascinating uh, conversation about the fascinating, albeit uh, obscure, object uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, cross-border interbank payment system. I so that I get the acronym right. Uh, finally, uh, our next session will be in three weeks' time. We'll be uh, finally talking about crypto for the first time, I think, in this series. Uh, we've waited a long time. That will be on Tuesday, the 13th of December, uh, with um, uh, with uh, with two speakers. I'm still finalizing the program, but uh, but on crypto and regulation. Uh, so um, thanks very much again to our speakers today, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.